Good evening and welcome viewers to Emil Short's take number two. Welcome my guests, gentlemen, and thank you for coming back to continue our conversation which we started last week but we were unable to complete. To my immediate left is, the, is Mr. Ayukoi Otu, uh, former Attorney General during the Kufu administration. And next to him is Mr. Tudazi, a former Chief of Staff during the Rawlings administration. Today, I would like us to look at a few more critical issues. First of all, um, women's representation in Parliament as well as in governance. And we'll also take a look at um, the president's power to appoint ministers from parliament and um, we would also if time permits look at the discussion which has been going on on the winner takes all system and its various manifestations so let's start with um, women's representation and the constitutional amendment that was recommended by the CRC and are accepted by government. Now as we all know, women comprise about 52% of the population and yet they are not adequately represented in parliament nor in public institutions nor in decision-making processes that affect their lives. We have signed quite a number of conventions, protocols and charters and yet implementation has been a problem. Political parties before the elections have always made promises about what they would do to ensure women's participation, but yet these promises have not been fulfilled. Um, the Constitutional Review Commission recommended that at least 30% of the composition of public institutions should be women. And also that we should also have an Aff Affirmative Action Act which will spell out the modalities for affirmative action. The question is, is this formula the stipulation that there should be at least 30% women representation in all public institutions. Is this the right way to go? And also, I would like you to comment on the white paper's rejection of the CRC recommendation that the political parties act should be amended so as to impose an affirmative action oriented orientation provision in the act. That recommendation was rejected by the white paper. So first of all, if I may start with you, Mr. Tudazi, do you think this recommendation for 30% uh, representation of women in all public institutions together with the affirmative action bill which is in the pipeline are these measures going to achieve the objective of gender equality and gender parity in our body politic? Yeah, thank you very much <clears throat> for having us again. Um, this whole issue about uh, gender inequality is a very serious matter indeed. As you rightly pointed out, 51, 50, 52% of our population are <clears throat> women but they are the least represented. Um, that, that's not good for uh, democracy, you know, the very tenet of ten democracy. Um, <clears throat> I think that the women have been pounding the, the, the gates of the democracy to ensure that it's open, they, they get greater representation. Nobody will give it to them. They will have to fight the battle through and through, as in the obvious uh, uh, jurisdiction. Now, we've come far, and um, the current propo proposal is that there must be at least 30% uh, you know, uh, representation on all public boards and appointments you know, for women. I think that it's a good start. 
clearly the issue of an affirmative action cannot be denied. I mean, I'm saying the, the, the rules and the constitutional provisions have been there. That there should be uh, what you call Article 17. All persons shall be equal before the law. This is uh, Article 35, 5, and 6. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the state should disallow discrimination based on, they should not allow discrimination based on gender and whatnot. These are all there. But we need to have legislation that will bite, that will ensure that it happens. And I think that the, the affirmative action uh, uh, law, it's, it's one of the things that can, you know, uh, stimulate this uh, process. 30 percent, yes, for me, it's a starter. But uh, as the, the, the CRC itself uh, found in their research, for instance, in the country, Argentina, they cited a exa very beautiful example of Argentina, where they also had literally no legislation on that. And in 1991, you know, the representation of women was something like 6%. Then they introduced the 30% quota. From 6% as at now, you have something like 34% representation of women on all boards and whatnot. You see, that's a, that's a positive quantum leap. You can see it, it gets me, in real terms. Now, the idea about affirmative action is that it compels the, the authorities, the persons who have the right to appoint, to, to, to look for women, to look for the, 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 to address the gender issue, you know, uh, more positively. So, and then there's a second thing about uh, the recent uh, Supreme Court ruling, the you know, judgment where they said that the Constitution both the substantive body as well as the directive uh, principles of state policy mm. are both justiciable, which means that literally every part of the constitution can be enforced mm. by anybody mm -hmm. going to court to say that, look, GBC, for instance, is, a, is an organization, it's a state organization. It has less than 30% representation. Supreme Court pronounced on this. I think the person will pronounce that. And there will obviously be sanctions attached to non-performance. What about parliament? For example, should we reserve certain seats, especially for women? And should political parties um, ensure that women stand in their safe seats to ensure that they are elected? Will that not be progressive measures Yes, as a, as, a, as a quick report to that, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a very small statistics, which are very staggering, mm -hmm. uh, which um, <clears throat> I, I saw in the report. It, it's uh, not just staggering, it's frightening. Well, in 1951, the statistics, 1951, Legislative Assembly of, uh, <clears throat> there was no woman. 53, there were 48 persons, there only one woman won. In 1959, Kwame Kuma decided to set up the representation of people, the Women's Act. It didn't work. It, it was very effective. In 1969, um, the Republican, uh, Second Republican Constitution, we had 140 MPs. Only one woman. 1993, 200 MPs. Only 14 women. 2001, 200 MPs. Only 18. 2005, as recently as 2005. Mm. 230 MPs, only 25 women. And presently? <laughs> yes, yes. So, well, well, this is what we are. So, back 2012. Then, back, so, 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 very late. But you see, <clears throat> if we were to insist on the 30% representation, mm. out of 230, you'd be looking at something like 73 or so women immediately. Mm. Mm. Must be there. Mm. You get me? Mm. And I, I think that. We, we will need to get the, like you said, get the political parties themselves yeah. must, must have their orientation skewed in such a way that they address the gender factor. Two days ago, we had this wonderful uh, super delegates conference by the MPP. Hmm. Not a single woman there. That's a point. The women were the ones who were voting. <laughs> 
I'm sure the same thing that happens in the MPP, <coughs> uh, N, sorry, NDC and PNC flood. So I, I think that, first of all, those who carry the political, you know, mantle must show greater commitment to the gender issue. So it's unfortunate that the white paper rejected the CRC recommendation that the Political Parties Act should be amended to impose an affirmative action orientation in the Act, which will compel political parties yeah, but the answer was, to yeah, take that response stand. was very simple. You know. so this was a matter that really required constitutional amendment. You know, if you have the uh, the the, the over uh, the overhead amendment that the, that says that there must be affirmative action, you know, um, in relation to the thirty percent, then it's across board. You don't need to amend specifically any particular legislation. It's across board. The the political parties are, are what do you call it? They're not public. Well, are they public institutions? Oh yeah, oh, they're, they're yes, private. They're private. They're uh, yeah, but they are regulated by by by. by they're public private art. institutions. They're private. Even so, even so, even so, they will have to. Okay, Mr. Yes. What, what's your take on this? Well, I, I largely agree with the sentiments expressed by him. I, I think it's more of also um, the political will to yeah. uh, push some of these things forward. As he rightly mentioned, Kwame Nkrumah tried to do that, and uh, Kufo came up with a whole ministry of women and children. You know, that's another attempt to ensure what they call gender mainstreaming, you know, ensure that we get women and put, you know, the, the focus on how to help women generally. With um, Article 17, some of them have the, uh, of the opinion that the word gender, you don't have to discriminate on the grounds of gender. To them, it's not sufficient because gender rather talks about rules that we have, you know, uh, assigned to, to men and women. So when you say, for example, that a person shall not be discriminated against on grounds of gender, mm. you know, it is, is it really talking about women? That's the issue that they raise. <laughs> that when you say gender, because the definition of gender, and I was just looking at the who definition of gender says, gender refers to the socially constructed rules behavior, activities, and attributes that a particular society considers appropriate for men and women. <laughs> yes, but I think in that context, gender is used interchangeably with... Um, yeah, men and women. Yeah, there, men are, women. there are cases that if you want to push the process of women, that yeah. in the case of women forward, <laughs> then they want something more... If you like woman like <laughs> the gender, which is neutral, because it could yeah. either be for men, it could I also yeah. be for, for women. I've sat through a few of these discussions. Again, we, we 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 need some training on some of these gender issues, you know. Not many people are well, you know, uh, 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 well vexed in these issues of gender. Some say, well, uh, you are your own enemies. You know, you get a woman who has a housemaid or house help, and the kind of treatment that they give to these women, you ask yourself, ah, are they not their worst enemies? Why can't they help bring them up? And things like that. But, or that, yeah, the school is there for everybody. Go. If you are able to make it, we will recognize you. But if you are not able, then of course you are restricted to the old adage that the, the place of the woman is a kitchen. You know, things like that. But it is when you have training on gender issues where you begin to realize that the population itself is about 52 percent, you know, tilted in favor of women and things like that. And they are very integral parts, like uh, uh, Quijiri Agri said. You, you, you educate a man, it's only one person. Educate a woman, and you've educated a nation. And you have an, a, you know, an educated woman at home. You see the difference. You know, she's going to help the children with homework because the children move or tilt towards the mothers more than the men. The men come home late, but the mothers are always around. You know. So if you have a lady who is educated, it can bring out your children and things you know, fast. And again, I mean, we have a, a, a positions that women can easily feel. Why, why should it always be a man's world? You know, but I, I believe that is a training that sometimes we don't have about gender issues, that rather 
lead to this kind of thing. In fact, my own, at, at the start of my learning of agenda, oh, I thought that affirmative action was, was, was not the way to go at all. I mean, why? Why? Because it will amount to discrimination. <laughs> to me, you'll be discriminating against the men. Article 17 it also uh, sanctions affirmative action. Yes. Yes. To redress imbalance, yes. historical imbalances yes. in the society. That's why I'm saying that yes. at the start of my training yes. in gender issues, I thought affirmative action was rather discriminatory against men and making things easy. Uh, why? We are going to exams or we're going to the university. They said the cutoff point is aggregate 16. Then you come and tell me because you are a woman, we should make it 20 for you. <laughs> are we not going to go through the same? Okay, you know, course and training. How are you going to, to you know, make it up if you, are, you come with a, a very bad grade, if you like, due to affirmative action? You know, but it's worked in other places, as I mentioned, in America. I'm told that affirmative action allowed a lot of black men mm -hmm. to enter into universities as well as to do courses like medicine. Otherwise, it was going to be a problem for some of them. You know, the way they set the bar and the things, you know, try to discriminate against them and then push them out. But well, you have an affirmative action that we should have, you know, in, for example, in a county where the overwhelming population is black mm. with a few whites, then the police officers must be blacks. Mm -hmm. they, they are those who take the decision. Otherwise, you bring a white police officer a commandant of the area, and he will be discriminating. Mm. Even there, you still have problems. You see the recent issues that we have with uh, somebody being shot when apparently has raised his hands up mm. and he was not armed and there was no need to kill him and all that, but then it went on. So affirmative action has its own role. I will support it. When it comes to the political parties, I think they also try. In, in a, with MPP, I do recall that the... the nomination or the filing fees are reduced mm -hmm. you know for women to en enable more of them to come on board but you know the issue with husbands you know you need to seek permission from your husband you know before you go into this you know rather turbulent field of politics because so the kind of need to seek uh, permission from his wife it is not <laughs> but you know but the turbulent <laughs> thing the, the way people are you know uh, uh, cast you know, <laughs> and the, the, the kind of abuses that are held at them, and, and the kind of... Uh, and the occasional violence. Uh, violence, that you know, is, that um, ensues. Associated exactly, with, with uh, election campaigning campaigns. and all that. And, and the quick, you know, attempt at uh, tagging them as uh, people of uh, loose values, you know, morals, in terms of morality or... These are people who are sleeping with everybody and things like that. One should understand that in terms of gender, they have a role to play and they should be supported to come on board. I mean, you, when, when you have a committee and, and we have a few women on it, you find that <laughs> the, the, some decisions are really toned down a bit because they come in and say, ah, this one is too ash. You know, why don't we do it this way? I remember Bar Association, we had all <laughs> a lot of men there. Then we once brought in a lady as a treasurer. You know what we were having for, for lunch? It was kebabs and groundnuts <laughs> and beer, you know, mm -hmm. after. I guess I know. We should go for to Papaya and get ourselves proper lunch. I mean, you can't be <laughs> doing this. <laughs> you know, so these are things that, you know, sometimes I wonder. Uh, what 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 the world will look like without women? I look at the rate at which men can cry, and then the rate <laughs> at which women cry and show emotions. You know clearly. After a, a time, by our training, we are told, "Oh, nufo, a man doesn't cry. Don't weep. Don't cry." So men get used to the fact that they don't cry. You get a situation very emotional, very traumatic. You need. To share tears, you can't do it, but you have a few women who would, you know, bring about the crying and the weeping. And the <laughs> you know, <laughs> apart from the numbers issue, mm -hmm. women have a different perspective which they can bring to a discussion of issues exactly. which men may not have.
So it's a question of an added value in, you know, in governance. Another thing you mentioned, which I think we need to uh, look at, is you spoke about uh, entrance examinations mm -hmm. and, and having different standards. Affirmative action is not dispensing with, you know, competence or, I mean, women would really object to any suggestion that affirmative action means that standards are going to be lowered, you know, because, you know, that is not the case. That is not the well, rationale the way behind, the, law will be be, behind uh, the affirmative action, uh, affection, affirmative action law. And I'm sure women will not take kindly to the suggestion that they will put in positions, I mean, the, the standards will be lowered for them. I don't I, think that I, that, I agree that is, with you. The that point is the I idea. make is that when you have this training about gender issues, mm. you begin to realize the value and the things that they can bring to bear on decision making. As against the fact that it's, um, it's a man's world and everybody appears to be doing his own thing. But to get them into certain positions, for example, uh, when it comes to the sciences, mm. you know from experience that it appears women like the arts, they like reading more than, you know, going to these science areas. And yet, if you have women doctors, I believe that their attitude towards patients, like the nurses, will be quite different from what we have from men. Well, somebody will tell you he's closed for the day. <laughs> he's going, why are you now coming? <laughs> I'm closed. He's, he's washing his hands. And he won't close. A woman may okay. not do that. May right, want let, to. Yeah. Let's, let's take a short break. <laughs> and when we come back, I'd like us to talk about the role of the media okay. in the way the media portrays women and how that affects, you know, uh, women in, you know, in their, their role in, in governance and uh, in decision making in our body politic. We are still discussing uh, Emil Short's take part two, and with me are my guest, Mr. Ayukoi Otu, a former Attorney General in the Kufu administration, and Mr. Atu a former Chief of Staff during the, um, the Rawlings administration. Um, the role of the media is critical to how people perceive women's role in society. We find that the media very often portrays women as sex objects, as mothers, and not as equal partners in decision-making uh, processes and in, you know, positions of authority. Isn't that also part of the problem that we have in our society? Well, I, can you blame the media? If, if um, we looked at the Western world and look at what they call celebrities, you know, those in the you know, music industry and the film industry, you know, and fashion, you know, one begins to wonder whether all that you need is not having been endured with beauty, you know, by their standards. Of course, we have our own standards of beauty here, but a certain, you know, slim figure or something there, it's okay for them, so by their standards. So you find that it becomes very easy if you find yourself beautiful and you get a, a promoter, you know, to just take you there and you become a model, you know, and you could maybe sing or you could also act and become a huge celebrity you know then you you find that we are into that area of trying to rather the media will, will, will put you behind a certain magazine and show your 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 qualities as a very beautiful woman see the eyes see the breast see this see that so sometimes i wonder whether they are not mirroring the things that we want to do because if you women want to <laughs> be seen as sex objects and models and fashion and things like that, that is what the media would also report. So the, the, if I, I am aware that uh, in the U.S. and Western world, there's so much equal opportunity for everybody to go to school, including scholarships, you know, that will be given to those who want to make it and don't even have money, go and borrow 
from the bank and you know uh, improve yourself so a lot of them also do the education aspect what about africa what about ghana do we really get into these things of trying to find money to go to school to educate ourselves or because we are beautiful we we, we think that we can do the cut walk and things and so be it so perhaps there the media will be mirroring the things that you are doing and you cannot blame them because if you see, there are times that we found in newspapers, you know, they're trying to, you know, show a woman who's done so well and uh, praise him that, look, we have this lady who is also a pilot or we have this lady who is an engineer, we have this lady. You know, those ones so are okay. there should be a balance. Yes. I mean, women should be portrayed in all their different Rules the which they, which they that perform is in society. <laughs> is it? You know, it's not just portraying them as sex objects or or their role as mothers, but as you point out, women occupy very important positions. They they should whatever roles they they occupy in society should be you know portrayed. I agree there should be a balancing act but my my take is this if more are into these fashions and the rest then there will be just a little that the media can also portray so that they also have a duty to ensure that I'm not just going to be uh, you know a fashion designer I'm not going to make clothes or just bags and things but I want to go to school in addition and you'll find that most of them who come to the limelight are those who have also go to, to the investors and the rest but they've taken to doing other things so I, I, say, I wonder what you work I wonder this. what your wife will think of <laughs> what Mr. Yuko, what are you saying yes well, well I, I think that to a large extent I uh, understand the sentiments he's expressing mm. really I mean the media merely mirrors society you get me? The, the journalists and editors and whatnot, they belong to us. How we think, our own, you know, process, thinking processes are the same as theirs. You get me? Well, how do we perceive women? Sex objects, beauty things, fashion, you know, you go and do, uh, what do you call it? Miss, Miss Ghana, Miss whatnot, you get a car. You know, the guy goes to, the same lady goes to school throughout seven years, uh, 13 years, you know, he's struggling to earn a living. You see, it's the value you give to your life. I, the way I look at these things about women, gender, and whatnot, it's not about how society should look at them. No. I, I, look, at, I look at this issue from how I perceive or how I hope my daughters, my own children hmm. will be. You understand? If yeah. we come to the term, in terms with that, then we will better appreciate it because i want my daughter i want the best for my daughter mm -hmm. i want her to i don't want my daughter to be a sex uh, object i don't want her to be the tout of the the she could be a fashion what do you call designer she could be miss ghana but i also want her to have brains i don't i don't want that so the point i'm making is that there are so many things we have to do in the society not just affirmative action listen when when our uh, what do you call the uh, policy uh, makers and what the lawmakers and the executives take decisions, you see, it reflects a certain mentality. Immediately, they put up a, a secondary school, sex male box, one female block. <laughs> you, you understand? Yes. Yes. In the, in, at the hospital, mm -hmm. there were six blocks for the males, one block female. You say, look, let's have one small. That, it, 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 it portrays a certain mentality that, you know, something that is glued in us. And that's the kind of thinking that we must change, the orientation that mm. we must bring to bear. Otherwise, the affirmative action will be meaningless. Mm. You understand? Right. It must start from the men. Okay. You see, the, the little bit about uh, the equity thing I have a problem with, you see, is that, that the, unless we nail gender in this house, particular circumstance, to women, We'll be looking at it from a theoretical point. But Article 17 is clear. It said, two, a person shall not be discriminated against on grounds of gender, yeah. race, yeah. color, ethnic origin, religion, creed, or social ec economic status, which means that the gender in this case has been limited. You get me? 
we want specifically and gender does not necessarily mean woman because mm. it will be man okay. you see so <laughs> yeah so uh i think i don't want to go too far but yeah. I, I, the point i'm saying is that the fight for gender on gender mm. should start for each man mm -hmm. how do you want to see your daughter you know mm -hmm. come out mm -hmm. in, in in the life in ghana mm. nowhere else but that should not make us criticize women who decide to be models or fashion oh, designers and in so fact, on. in fact um, uh, just uh, in fact the point i'm making is yeah. that i wish my daughter would be miss ghana Oh. And also go through school and hit the highest academically. Okay. I wish both for her. Okay, all right. See, okay. We, we, as we said, it's okay. mirroring society. Yeah. So if these are the things we do, yeah. then that is more that the media would report. Yeah. Uh, as we try to move away from there, everybody realizes the need for education to become something and then add on the rest. Yeah. That will be it for everybody. All right, let's move on to mm -hmm. another issue which confronted the Constitutional Review Commission, and that is the question of the President's power to appoint ministers from Parliament. And the government accepted the CRC recommendation that the Constitution should be amended to give the President a free hand to appoint ministers from within or without Parliament as well as the related recommendation that a person appointed a minister from parliament may retain his or her seat in parliament. Is this not a retrogressive step? Because in theory, what it means is that a president can decide to appoint all his ministers, his or her ministers, from within parliament and weaken parliamentary oversight uh, of the executive. Secondly, experience has shown that it is very difficult for one person to discharge effectively the functions of a minister and an MP. And given the problems we have in our country as a developing nation, I can't understand how ministers can claim to be doing their job well and at the same time representing their constituencies as MPs. So I think, and I feel very strongly about it, that we should take the bull by the horn and decide that if you want to be an MP, then you pursue your career as an MP. But we should not have a situation where the president can appoint an MP, a minister, and then the MP retains his or her seat. That is not, I don't think it's helpful. And recently, the Speaker has, on a few occasions, cautioned ministers who have failed to appear in Parliament to answer questions and also to take part in deliberations of Parliament. For the simple reason that they are unable to, 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 to be there because they have, so many, they, they have you know, so many duties to perform as ministers. I think that this recommendation is rather taking us back, giving the president a free hand to appoint ministers, all his ministers, from within or outside parliament. Mr. Well, I, let me say that the history that I do recall, you are older than me, you can confirm that, is this... Um, the problem with uh, is it Dr. Lehman losing yeah. the budget, you know, <laughs> budget proposals uh, policy which is sent to Parliament, because the ministers he had were all outside from Parliament, and therefore the parliamentarians. I understand that there was some issue about some allowances which had not been paid. He decided to boycott the, that, that particular session. At the end of the day, they lost on a very critical you know, financial policy for the state. So maybe the constitutional drafters looked at it and said, no, never again. Then we'll give you now the power to appoint your people also from within parliament and outside parliament. We'll be giving the free hand to do that. First of all, there is one advantage that 
comes to mind immediately. Politics is not for everybody. There are people who are prepared to work, you know, as ministers of states, and yet they cannot go through this uh, campaigning, you know, uh, seizing uh, with all this attendant violence and abuses and where the abuses are, the guy will say, they will even send you to your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> People who are dead, your yeah. you know, parents who are dead, people you you revere so much, you know, and, and, and concocted stories are made about you. So the president, with his freedom, can look at the field, you know, and say, look, I'm looking for an attorney general. This gentleman is not uh, an MP. I think he can do this job for me. So let me bring him on board. Remember that his qualification should be that of a parliamentarian. He should have the same qualification of a parliamentarian because he's going to be a non-voting member of parliament when he comes. So he may have the, 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 the same uh, qualifications of those who are there as parliamentarians. And the idea is that perhaps there are those very good people who can assist, you know, run the country uh, and yet they don't want to go through politics. That is where the idea is coming from. Now, we, 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 the problem you have raised is real because when they are unable to attend parliament, what parliament does is merely to adjourn proceedings. Uh, Peter Lajete, I remember always cautioning people, please come, you have to be here, so, so, so you cannot be late without any you know, uh, uh, excuse and things like that. But you go and sit down, and they are just not there. So you are for, compelled to, you know, postpone or agenda proceedings. Again, when there is something very important, then you see MPs who are also, say, regional ministers from the north, from Bogatanga, from so so and so, being flown in to come and make the numbers to intimidate the minority. <laughs> So when you yourself, you see the people sitting there, nobody will tell you not to push it because when it comes to vote, you lose. They are all there for important matters. But it doesn't really, you know, uh, 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 the issue you have raised, the oversight responsibility of parliament, whether indeed they are able to do it. Because the people in parliament, the MPs, have an eye on being appointed ministers one day. So they don't want to rock the boat. If they, 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 if they see something going on wrongly in the executive, everybody, ash, ash, ash. Because if you go and say it, you will not get a chance. We have just recently seen the majority leader being appointed a minister of what? Interior or mm -hmm. some defense. 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 You know, and perhaps he enjoys that one better than the city parliament. Because it would have been discussed with him. He is a minister for parliamentary affairs. So he goes to cabinet. Yet he is prepared to forgo that one and take another ministerial appointment for defense. So this man, how do you expect him? You know, I'm just making an example. How do you expect such a person to criticize the government in that role? He would just be singing that tune of executive just to ensure that one day he would also be cited. He would catch the eye of the president and will be given a post. So those are real problems, but with the history. And when that the, opportunity doesn't exist, then the MPs would be able to, in a very robust manner, criticize programs and policies of government. I think so. You can develop that work. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> welcome back, viewers. And uh, with me, uh, my guests on Emil Schultz part, Take Part 2, Mr. Yuko Otu and Mr. Atudazi. Um, Mr. Atudazi, we are going to respond to yes. this issue about the president appointing ministers from parliament. Yes, sir. Um, this, basically, just to give our viewers uh, some understanding, you know, in, in the UK, you, you have <coughs> the ministers, they are in parliament, all of them, literally. Uh, in, 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 in the U.S., the ministers are literally out of Congress or out of Parliament, you see. So there's something there. But in Ghana, we decided a hybrid system where we say that some of the ministers should be from Parliament, some should be from outside Parliament. We've tried it. And like, like what my colleague said, I mean, are, the problems are showing. Mm -hmm. You get me? Mm -hmm. Now, one fundamental question you were saying, 
you appoint an executive president and then you you restrict his capacity to deliver you say no 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 you are executive president you can do everything but you must appoint 50 percent of your ministers from parliament what about if that 50 percent does not exist in terms of competence and capability that is not to demean parliament in any way oh. you understand it might be an area of speciality there is an area in appointment i know that where ministers uh, the presidency that both in all various governments you appoint people to make up numbers mm -hmm. you see you appoint this and you keep an eye on you know the fact that you 50 percent must come from uh, parliament so you appoint the person into uh, uh, as you know somebody to, uh, to the presidency it, it, it's a very worrying thing and that's how traditional people will say you don't sell a goat and then you know hold the tail I mean, if you want the president to deliver, give him a free hand. Let him choose the best man that he can, and let us go. Whether it's a transgressive step, I, I find it well, challenging. If the, the, the best people he wants are in parliament, shouldn't they then vacate their seat? And then you have a by-election. Yes, that, that, is an, that is an issue that was not really resolved throughout and i think that like i keep saying these are matters which for the future we could look at but the the fact that the 50 percent restricts the field of choice the danger is really not in choosing more from parliament inside parliament but the fact that the president doesn't have the capacity to go outside parliament that is really the problem that's the real problem. The problem is not that you can for 50 percent. Uh, you can you can get them. You can get them from parliament. You can have a point. But then let me say it restricts the choice for the president. A whole nation, 230 people, they don't have all the capacity. And I think that there's merit in mm -hmm. saying that free the president, whoever is the president, let the president make a choice across board. If parliament has that. Um, what, married, if, the what if he decides yes, to appoint not? all of his ministers from within parliament? I'm, I'm saying that then that must be a very rich parliament indeed in terms <laughs> of competence, you know. But um, don't forget that. With the purpose that. of no. trying to yes, weaken I'm, I'm saying I, I want to parliament's oversight responsibility of the exactly, executive. Exactly. Professor Okwe advocates strongly for the concept of uh, what do you call total abolition of appointment from within parliament. Which we're saying mm -hmm. and i agree and he says that look the danger there uh, from his own analysis is that people seek to catch the eye of the president yes. and not the eye of the speaker mm -hmm. you get me yeah. uh, it, it, it throws everything out but i'm saying that it is not the the 50 percent uh, selecting 50 percent from parliament or more is not an issue it's not because it doesn't really arise much the real burden for which this is being done is because the president is not giving a free hand to choose from outside okay. uh, the parliament. All right, yeah, no man, we don't have much time, so <laughs> yes. I would like us to okay. look at one issue which recently has been in the public domain discussed very widely, and that is the winner-takes-all system which we practice, whereby um, the party that wins the presidency has the exclusive prerogative to make all ministerial appointments, ambassadorial appointments, appointments to public boards, and appointments to the governance institutions, uh, Shraj, Electoral Commission, and so on. And the practice whereby these appointments are made to benefit party supporters and loyalists to the exclusion of real or perceived political opponents. And in some cases, these appointments are not made out of on the basis of merit. Now, when this happens, you know, um, it has created some kind of division and resentment. And it has made our elections a do or die affair. Because the stakes are so high. It's a zero-sum game. <coughs> you win, you win everything. You lose, you lose everything. Especially in a situation where 
we don't have polit um, state funding of political parties and especially in our situation where the difference between the votes of the to the, the winner and the person who comes second is so narrow, 300,000 to 400,000 votes, less than even the spoil ballots. Mm -hmm. You know, in a situation like this, it has created enmity and our elections have become so tense, people have to the churches, the, 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 the mosque, everybody has to be praying to make sure that our election does not result in chaos. And it's all because of this system. It has been suggested that we should devise a system whereby there is some accommodation that even if a party loses in making appointments, uh, minorities should be considered. There's not in the constitution which compels the president to appoint all his ministers and all ambassadors from his uh, party or party supporters. But here this is the practice. And this is what has created so much division and tension in our politics. Don't you think we should have an alternative system? For example, it has been suggested that when it comes to appointment of let's say, strike commissioners, deputies, electoral commission, and even the chief justice, that the approval by parliament should be by two-thirds majority, so that minority parties also can have a role. And even some have suggested that there should be civil, civil society uh, consensus, not, not just consensus, but consultation. For example, in appointing the chief justice, not only should approval be by two-thirds majority, but at least maybe consultation with the Ghana Bar Association, so that we end up having, you know, credible, competent, and independent-minded people who command the respect and support of everybody across board. Don't you think that well, there is, is a advocacy. time for us to <laughs> rethink this winner-takes-all system well, they, and, 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 it's, and you know, the President Mahama himself yeah. recently has expressed reservations about the system, although I don't know what he's doing about it. But significantly, the NPP has been very quiet. I don't know that you are just waiting in the wings, hoping that when you take over, then you would also have the opportunity to, to explore the spoils of office. Is that equal to? Well, looking at the constitutional provisions as we have them now, uh, the thing is that uh, we elect a president and thereafter we give him the power to make the appointments. I don't think the Constitutional, uh, you know, the Constitutional Review Commission looked at this aspect and... Uh, they did. They, they added they, that if I, these appointments should now be made with the approval of Parliament rather than just in consultation with the Council with, of State. Uh, okay. Good. But a simple majority mm -hmm. rather than a superlative two-thirds majority, yeah. which I think is what some people are, are advocating. Yeah, but as so long as you have that executive presidential powers to make the appointments, mm -hmm. he will continue to make the appointments and he will be able to influence them anyway. I mean, order from above that you try and uh, 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 endorse this gentleman. You know, uh, before you say that, that's politics for you. That person will be endorsed even when he's not, you know, the best. But again, the the, the kind of uh, 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 elections that we run, you know, is such that uh, it is the majority that forms the government. We we don't have the proportional thing where maybe you give a list of names and the parties decide that you know for this constituency these people are okay to represent and which which would allow you know others to have the opportunity so yeah. again we may have to look at rethink that issue the winner takes all at the end of the day if it is not provided for anywhere the the idea of bringing somebody outside your party if it's not provided for anywhere depends again on the president 
I think Mr. Kufu, President Kufo was able to do that. He brought in Moses, Danny Bain, a few people from PNC, also appointed people like uh, Professor Egan to the Commission on Culture and things like that. You know, so, and I'm surprised because, as you rightly pointed out, the president has made those, expressed those sentiments. Yet, we are not sure. Of, of course, we have said Nana, Professor uh, Nana Jean Opoku, is it, the Minister for Education. We, nobody knows where she belongs to, at least, as far as we were concerned. We saw a moderating a presidential debate <laughs> thereafter. She was you know, appointed. I can't recollect immediately, but I think on one of these programs, Amaliba gives some other names of people who have been appointed. I think from other parties, I, I do recall a um, yes. news file some yes. time ago. PNC mentioned a few people who have also been appointed. So the practice is there, but it's a will, the political will. And then, my brothers, the, the old folks in the party how do they see this this so-called stranger who is being brought in why how should, do they why treat should, him why should you why should you look at somebody like that as a stranger has he spent money if that yeah. if that person money? has the competence the expertise uh -huh. to be able to contribute to national development they are looking at it from the point of view of monies that has been spent on campaign you know, and ask themselves, you, you this stranger, what, what have you done? I am talking from experience because I went into it like that from outside. And I saw a lot of some of these things where you'll be literally shunned by those who think they have spent money and you did not spend money. You know, and things like that. that this is practical, what I know. And therefore, sometimes it's, it's a tricky thing. You're talking you know. about like a politician. Oh, right? yes. <laughs> but, but I want you to look at it from the position of a concerned citizen yes. who is interested in ensuring that we have national integration, we have consensus building, yeah. we have some kind of power sharing so that, you know, our elections does not become a do and die affair. It's the reality uh, on the ground. The reality on the ground makes it a little bit difficult. I was just going to chip in something when you said we didn't have time. Parliamentarians rather would prefer that they are appointed ministers no, because no. they have a dual safety cut somewhere. When because of what you call it, a cabinet reshuffle, okay. somebody loses his position. We are running he will out tell of time, Mr. I would like to hear what Mr. Chudazi has to say on this. I'll continue. to be there. And, and <laughs> don't speak as a politician. Yeah, it's a uh, well no, I, I see myself as a lawyer, first and foremost, and a uh, member statesman. You know, basically, I think Trump is trying first against it. Basically, I think that the concept of winner takes all, that being thrown out should be cautiously handled because the way people are carried it is seeks to undermine the fundamental you know agreement that the parties have made the people of this country decided they will go by way of multi-partism and we should keep on track i think we should keep on track now there are challenges arising out of this multi-partism which you know, because multi party is based on uh, what they call it challenges, competition, and whatnot. You win, you win that kind of thing. Now, out of it, unfortunately, people are well, would appear the system is being corrupted or abused, and I think that that's what uh, the ordinary people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And we must isolate that and deal with it. Actually, last Saturday, that Santini would raising the same issue that is multi partyism is being given a bad name by certain issues like corruption and whatnot. They are distinct right. from the competitive nature of the thing. The reward system and whatnot. Unfortunately, we we've it. run out of time. Yes. <laughs> Viewers, all too soon it seems that um, we've come to the end of the program. I'm sure you found it very entertaining, very instructive and very enlightening. I would like to take the opportunity to thank my guests for coming again to conclude our discussion on the constitutional amendment process. Thank you very much.